Amen. So good to see you today. Hey, so Jesus is an evil person to me. That's what she said. She said, Jesus is an evil person to me. I was in Africa. I was in Jos, Nigeria, West Africa. I was speaking uh, for about 10 days or so to a primarily to a Christian uh, school, and I was also speaking out and about large numbers of Muslims uh, sharing the gospel. I mean, doing some kind of apologetic kind of work towards Christ as the Messiah. But I was teaching at this Christian school, and this is where I met Tabitha, I'll call her, um, and, and she was a high school kid, and I could tell by looking at her, you can tell sometimes there's a story there. So we're talking, I'm telling her about how much God loves her, and trying to just learn her story and and it was then when she said uh this to me we're talking about her family she she said so my dad's uh, an mk he's a mission she's she i mean she was an mk a missionary kid her dad was a missionary and they would they would live in this one area where all the kids lived in this hostel and dorms and such and they went to this christian school the parents would would be serving all over uh africa really and and uh, her dad would go out and for years, as she was growing up, he was a missionary, telling people about Jesus, sharing the gospel. Then he'd come back when he was home. There were times and seasons, periods where he would become enraged in the home and he would beat her older brother and her. He would abuse them physically. That's when she said, Jesus is an evil person to me. Think about that. I mean, you see what's going on there, right? This transference of, of, wait, wait, so he bears the name of Jesus. He, he is a Christian. He's actually out there telling people about Jesus, sharing the gospel, evidently. But then he comes back and he doesn't live like Jesus at all. You know, and, and this whole, whole story is so impacted my life in, in, in two ways. The power of a father in the lives of children. And a father who would actually take on the name of Christ, in our, in our hope today, actually live like Jesus in the home. So that like, like food through the body, like, like one person to another, this is passed on to our children so that they say, I, I, I get it, God's a loving father. He, he's kind and, and he's forgiving and he's always seeking what's best for me. But in her case, couldn't, couldn't equate, couldn't, couldn't put it together. And who blames her? The second thing I see here is how it's possible to misrepresent Jesus, to say that someone who's holy and righteous and perfect is actually evil. How does that happen? And it's, if you think that, well, that's kind of an extreme story, a very extreme story, in fact. But we all profane the name. Of Jesus. And that's what we're going to get to. We're going to get to the third commandment. You can turn to Exodus chapter 20. Why don't you do that? Turn to Exodus 20. It's one, you know, it's one commandment. We're going to jump around to some other passages. But Exodus 20, you can also find the Ten Commandments in, in Deuteronomy 5. I don't know if you know that. Kind of a second telling of the law. But we've said that all of God's commands come out of a heart of, law, out of, heart of love. We've said that He first rescues the people. He doesn't give them the commands while they're in Egypt. They, he rescues them out, you know, establishes relationship with them. He already had done that. And so relationship, then the rules. Okay, this is important to understand. Relationship always precedes the rules, if you will, okay, uh, with God. And in the same way, we, we've said it here. This is a great word for dads today. Um, rules without relationship breed rebellion in the lives of your children. God, the perfect parent, the perfect father, knows this. And so in the first commandment, he says, hey... Uh, I've rescued, out, I've rescued you guys out of Egypt. I've already done this thing. Now, let me show you how to, how to live, the Ten Commandments here, along with other laws. But he says, I am God. I'm the one who brought you out. That's me. There are no other gods, just me. The second commandment, he says, listen, don't create any, other, any image or try to worship something. Uh, put me in a box, basically. We talked about it last week, as if we want God to be our genie, Right? We want him to be just kind of, we put him in a little box, and if he's like this then, and, and fits my understanding, then I can worship him. I'll follow him. We could even do this in our gatherings. It's when people say, um, 
Gosh, if we, if we worship like this, if I'm in this place, or if we, we sing these songs, or my style, my, my preference, my form, what I want it to be, I will worship God. I can't worship God in, in those other ways. Can't do it. We're withholding our worship. Based on our own preference, we want God in a little box as if he's a genie. And in the first two commands, he says this. He says, I'm God. I'm not your genie. I will call the shots and you will follow me. And then he gets to this, this third command. But before we get there, I want, to, I want you to think with me for a, for a bit about what, an, what is this name of the Lord? Why, why would he be so so you know, so clear about, listen, don't abuse my name. I mean, at first glance, we're like, wow, okay, ease up, you know. But, this, but, but we're going to see how powerful this is. I, I offered the often quoted A.W. Tozer who said this, what comes into our minds when we think of God is the most important thing about us. We talked about this last week, and this is so important. Even when we think about Tabitha and her story, what comes into her mind when she thinks of Jesus is the most important thing about us. As it, as it was for her and for all of us. And the first thing you think about, even in that statement right there, that quote, is his name, right? God. And so when we say God, we have different ideas in our minds. So look at Ex Exodus 20, verse 7. God has already said, okay, I am the great I am. That's who I am. I, I was, I am, and I always will be. And then he says this in verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, y'all, listen. This is, this is serious stuff. The latter part of this verse says, will not cleanse him. It's another way of saying, he will not be forgiven. So I've sorted through that this week. Like, whoa. What does that mean? So we're going we're gonna to land there, all right, before we finish this out. But a lot of us look at this one and we go, oh, yeah, don't cuss. Yeah, I get that. Don't cuss. Don't use the name of the Lord, you know, God. Don't, don't use his name in vain. Or how about this? To um, the height of arrogance, to call on him to curse someone towards eternal damnation. As if, again, God's our genie. Bam, zap them, please. Or, or in the moment of rage to say it. I mean, it's arrogance, and we're using his name flippantly. And you might say, well, I'm, I'm good. I don't, I don't do that. I mean, that's, that's, that's bad. But here's what a lot of us do. A lot of us do, how about this? We use his name flippantly when we, when we do something like even text. OMG. In surprise, right? Now, I'm not a prude, but think about it. Nothing about his, reverencing his name, holiness of his name, LOL, OMG. We just toss his name around. And as we'll see today, uh, we profane his name. You see, we abuse his name. We, we, we bring irreverence or disdain to his name when we don't hold it highly. In fact, to profane his name, that, there's that word, profanity. This is where we get that word. It's to make something holy, even righteous, and beyond our, our understanding, to bring it down and, and then to to use it in ways that are frivolous and, and wrong. It's, it's, how about this? It's wearing the jersey, but you're not on the team. Or wearing the jersey and you're not helping the team. It's to use his name in vain. It means, vain means, uh, you, you know the word vanity, out of like Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity. Meaningless, uh, useless, of, of no meaning, empty, inconsequential. You see how radical this is? To take his name and make it nothing. To, 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 to empty God of His glory by making trivial what He has established as holy. You see how serious this is? And this is a weighty, weighty command, as all of them are. So let's think about this before we get to application. What's in a name? All right, think with me. What's in a name? First, your name identifies who you are, right? This week, I, I had a jury summons. And so I'm sitting in the big crowd of people, and I'm waiting on, no, I was like, don't call my name. Don't, don't, I mean, all about the judicial system. But I'm like, I could get back to VBS, you know, don't call my name. So I took books in there, I was studying for this sermon, in fact. And I'm sitting there, and they start calling out the first round, right? I'm like, uh-uh, 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 no, uh-uh, not me, not me, you know, because my name, I didn't, it locates me, Right? That's me. And, and so then, there, then a gap goes. You know how this works, right? And like, 
Two hours later, um, we're, I'm sitting in there still, and she comes up and says, okay, if I call your name, uh, you can be dismissed. So I'm like, okay, now, now come on, call my name. I want to hear my name. And I haven't been as excited to hear my name, you know, in a long time. And, and so, sure enough, she says, if you're here, uh, when I call your name, say, here. You know, and harken back to when I was a kid, remember, like, present, you know, when you call out your name. And, and so she calls out all these names, and here, here. Calls out my name. Here. I was all happy because that's like, that's me. You just called my name because our name identifies us, right? It separates us. Watch this. God's name separates him from all other names. And so consider the name of God, right? His name is Yahweh, is the name of God that we see introduced here. And the people knew him as Yahweh. You can see the Hebrew there, the Hebrew letters. It's four, um, four letters, it's called the Tetragrammaton. All right, kids, everybody say Tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton. Sounds like a, sounds like a um, what do you call it, a transformer. That's what it sounds like. Or a, or a dinosaur or something like that. Um, but Tetragrammaton, it means four letters. And, and those letters are Yahweh. There's no, no vowels, only consonants. And, and, and there's, not a, um, there's not a W in, in modern Hebrew, so sometimes you see the V. But then they added vowels, and it became Jehovah. And we see Yahweh or Jehovah 6,800 times in Scripture. And the word Jehovah, with the vowels added, Yehovah is the name that comes from Yahweh. One time I was teaching on this in a large crowd, and there was a Jewish man who came up afterwards, and he was offended that I had been saying the name of Yahweh out loud. Because you see, in Orthodox Judaism, Torah-observant Jews would never say the name of God. Never. Only the high priest could say it, and only at certain times in the year. You'd never profane his name by using your own lips to say his name. They wouldn't write it. They, even now, you can go like online, even it's like G slash D. Like you're not even going to write the whole thing out there. And you might say, well, that's kind of silly, but consider that. They exalt his name so much that they don't even want to say his name because we might perhaps profane his name by saying it out loud. He's that holy. So his name identifies him. But look at this. Your name reveals who you are. You carry your name. Think about that. You want to be true to your name. You want your name to have good reputation. But I'd say this, dads, all of us here, you take care of your character and your reputation will take care of itself. But we want our name to mean something, right? But think about it. In the Bible, the name uh, represents character. I could say it this way. The name is the same. Now, it's not the person of, but it's the same. Think about what the Bible says. We, 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 in the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. We praise the name of the Lord, our God. We trust in the name of the Lord, our God. Worthy is the name of God. In fact, in Romans 10, 13, it says, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord... We'll be saved. Jesus taught us when we pray, the first thing we do, hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. Now you're in position to pray. We profane his name when we pray, and we don't pray according to his name. We profane his name when we, you know, just flippantly pray. Jesus, in fact, said this to his disciples in John 16, 24. He said, until now, you haven't asked anything in my name. Interesting. What he's saying is, y'all have been praying, but you haven't been praying according to my character. My name is the same. You're not praying according to my will, you see. So your name identifies who you are, your name reveals who you are, and your name represents who you are. Or we might be representing someone else. It's like when you wear your favorite sports Team, on your shirt, I'm representing, right? Or, or your, your, your favorite college or whatever. In fact, this is interesting. The Hebrew word for take, when you take, don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Literally, it means to put on, to wear. It's like wearing the jersey, but you're not helping the team. You're not representing him well. I had a politician one time, many years ago, he wanted me to put, he wanted to put my name on a mailing list. And I told him, I don't, I don't sorry, uh, but don't want my name to be used for political purposes. But, but really, I didn't know him that well. 
I didn't, I didn't want my name to be attached to something that would not be God-honoring, right? I don't know what you're going to do with my name. You see, the name then represents the person. This is what happened to the people of Israel. They were actually put into exile, it's very explicit, because they profaned the name of the Lord. That's why they were, they were sent off in exile. Meaning, they, they, they took on His name, they had His name, but they didn't live as separate, holy, distinct people. And this is the problem with the church today, isn't it? It's always been the challenge. When we live our lives like Jesus, follow the way of Jesus, then, then people see Him in us, and the gospel is advanced. But when, we, when our lives don't match up with who He is, we profane His name. So think about this. Let's, let's look at some ways we profane His name. We profane His name when we, first of all, we claim to, be, uh, to follow Him, but we don't pursue Him. It's possible to study the Scripture even and not pursue Christ. Jesus was noting this in John 5 when He said, You study the Scripture diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very Scriptures that testify about Me. But look at what He says. Yet you refuse to come to Me to have life. It's possible. And this is why people... Uh, par- you know, it's paramount that we study God's Word. It's why we have our connect groups. You need to be in one. And dads, you need to lead the way. Every Sunday, because we study His Word, but if we simply study His Word to get to know more, some of the smartest, wisest, most biblically proficient people I know are some of the most judgmental, prideful, unkind people I know. How's that happen? Because we thought it was all about knowledge, right? Listen, Jesus is perfect theology. Jesus is perfect theology. So when we claim to follow Christ, but we don't pursue Him daily in the home, Dads, we send a mixed message to our families. Look, secondly, we claim to know Him, but we don't abide in Him. Look at how explicit this is in 1 John, the Apostle John. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not keep His commands is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps His word, in Him truly the love of God is perfected. You follow Him, you become like Him. By this we may know that we are in Him. Whoever says He abides in Him ought to walk in the same way in which He walked. You see, and this happens when we claim that God's telling me this. I'm hearing from God. We ought to be saying, no, the Bible says. This is why dads, all of us, you need to know the Bible. I love, you know, Billy Graham's legacy. He didn't, always, he didn't, he didn't say, let me tell you what I think about this particular topic. What did he always say? The Bible says. The Bible says. We need more of that. In fact, I saw this week, was it uh, Jesse Duplantis? He's a televangelist. He said that he had a personal conversation with Jesus. Did anybody see this? And Jesus told him to buy a jet, a $50 million jet. And Jesus, in his conversation, named the jet specifically, the Falcon 7X. Now we, now we kind of laugh and like, yeah, what? It's possible, look, to know the Word of God, but not know or live in the way of Jesus. To not follow Christ himself, all right? Thirdly, look at this. We claim to want more of Him, but we don't more, want more of His people. Now, perhaps I'm preaching to the choir today, but in Hebrews 10, 25, it says, don't neglect the gathering, the saints, because together we pursue Him, we run after Him. And men, listen, Dad, you need to be in accountable relationship with other men. Isolation leads to destruction. You know there's certain things grow in the dark, right? Think about it. Mushrooms grow in the dark. Fungus grows in the dark. Sin grows in the dark. And when we are in community together, living our lives together, then we're brought into the light. That's why some men aren't courageous enough to have close relationships. Because your sin is brought out in the light. Dads, listen, be courageous and enter into real community. Fourthly, we claim to love Him, but we don't love others. Again, the Apostle John is very explicit. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. These are strong words. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God who he's not seen. So we claim to love him, but we, how about this, when we only love certain people, certain groups of people, I love a certain race of people. I love my people, but I don't love others. You see, this this is what he's saying here. No, no, no. Christ, he loves all people. Number five, we claim to worship him, but we don't obey him. We profane his name. When we, when, when we sing songs, this is why it's kind of dangerous. 
We sing songs that, yes, are aspiring, but if our, if our words that we sing, we proclaim with our lips, don't match our lives during the week, we profane His name. You're taking His name in vain. If you come to worship and you flippantly kind of, oh yeah, Christ died on the cross for me. We're singing all about that. This is glorious. Someday I'm going to heaven. <sighs> wow. Oh. I mean, you profane His name. You're making meaningless what is holy and righteous. You see, this is the problem in many of our lives. And here's what happens. In Amos 5, a passage where he says, God is speaking through Amos and he says, enough of your songs. I don't want your offerings. I don't want your sacrifices. In fact, he says, on with your noise. I don't want to hear it anymore. And they're singing to him. He says, no, no, no. Instead, let justice fall like water. Let righteousness come like streams of ever, uh, an ever-flowing stream, he says. In other words, he's saying, no, no, no. Let your lives match up with what you're singing. Then it makes sense to me. Then you're not profaning my name. Friends, that's why every time we gather, we got to come with our hearts filled with him. And look at this. The last thing I want to say is this. We claim to be like him, but we don't live like him. We profane his name. Really, all of this sermon is summarized in this. When we claim to be Christ-like, but we don't live like Christ. Right? In Titus 1.16, it says this. They profess to know you, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Friends, this is a challenging, I know, prophetic message today. But I want you to think about it. If you're wearing the jersey... Are you living for Him? Do you need to confess your sin to Him today? Many years ago, I was with my family. We went to a Ranger game. And we were there early. There were lots of, you know, not many people there. And we came to our seats. So we kind of found our row and our section. And uh, there weren't a lot of people there, but there was this one little family sitting here. A guy with his family. His kids. I had my little kids with me. And uh, I said, hey, excuse me, sorry. We're right. We're right over here. Excuse me. You know, it started in. He had his feet up on the on the seats and he just froze and he looked at me I said uh, sorry we're right um, excuse me I'm sorry we're right down here and he didn't move and his wife even was picking up what's going on she, she goes honey she slapped him on his leg because you see there was, a, there was an aisle that went down you know several aisles down and then a walkway and then you go back up the other aisle and I could, I could have done that I could have gone the long way around my seats are right here and so I looked down, and when I, I looked at him again, I, I, for real. And his kids were watching this. And, and I noticed he had a Baptist church shirt on. Now, I don't, I don't always do this. But I leaned down, and I said, bro, you need to take that Baptist church shirt off. And I walked on and said, kids, let's go. We walked around, went over and found our seats. He's wearing the jersey, profaning the name by being unkind, not gracious. Now, Grant, he had lots of grace. He may have had a bad day right in front of his kids. Our kids are watching us. Dad, you represent God to your children. But look at what happens. You want to think about this? What's in the name? So Joshua is Yeshua. Yeshua, or how about this? Jehovah is Yeshua. Yeshua is Joshua. Joshua is the name of Jesus, which literally means Yahweh saves. You see, Yahweh, his presence was in the tabernacle. The location of his presence was in the tabernacle. Jesus comes. And John tells us in chapter 1 that he tabernacled among us. He came in the flesh and the presence of God, Spirit, is located, resides in the person of Jesus. Yeshua, Joshua, God, Yahweh saves. He says, you've been looking for him. You've not seen him. But if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You've seen Yahweh. Christ comes. So that Paul would say in Philippians 2, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, 
so that at the name of Jesus, hallelujah, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now I told you we'd get back to this piece. I'll close with this. It says this sin will not go unpunished. And I'm thinking this week, I'm going, oh my gosh. I know I've done this. I'm sure I've used his name flippantly. I've probably attributed things to him or said things that God said this. And he's going, I didn't say that. Profaning his name. I'm sure my life is not always matched up with who he is and who he wants me to be. I'm thinking, Lord, what does this mean? And then I remembered on this side of the cross. I can't tell you today that I, my life is completely congruent with the life of Jesus. I can't tell you that today I'm worshiping Him in a way that's exactly the way that He wants me to worship Him. I can't tell you that, that everything I've ever said aligns with exactly who He is. But I can tell you this. Though I am not worshiping perfectly, I know that Jesus has always worshiped the Father perfectly. I haven't always loved Him like I should, but I know this. Jesus has loved the Father perfectly on my behalf. You see, the unforgivable sin that we see then in the New Testament, Jesus says, is to claim that something that's holy is actually evil. Like Tabitha, Jesus is an evil person to me. If she remains in that state, ultimately it's the sin of unbelief. That's the unforgivable sin. Not believing that God and His name is holy and righteous. And watch this. That Christ Himself is the very name of God in the flesh. If you don't believe that, that's the unforgivable sin. And that is where punishment comes. Eternity apart from Him. Friends, do not leave here today without clearing that one up. Making sure that you know that you've given your heart to Him because you have profaned the name of God. But He'll forgive you as you turn to Him. Though some will go punished, you'll go unpunished because your punishment has come upon Christ. All you have to do is receive His grace by faith. Let's pray together as we close. Lord God, we have all profaned Your name. We've used your name in vain. We have not followed you as we should. and We've worshipped you in frivolous ways, flippant ways. You are holy. You are righteous. You are God. And so we give you our lives, Lord. And I pray for every person here who, who may not have, have settled this by faith that they would receive your grace today. Friend, right where you are, you just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for coming and living the perfect life. Worshiping the Father perfectly. Taking on His name. So that I might trust you with my life. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Give Him your life now. Say yes to Him. And you will be forgiven. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for being that perfect Father today. As we commit our lives completely to you. In your name we pray. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.